Hello, everyone, and welcome. We're excited that so many of you could join us today for On the Web of Meaning with Jeremy Lent and Matthew Siegel. I'm Jason MacArthur, the Events Coordinator for the Public Programs Department of the California Institute of Integral Studies, a nonprofit university in San Francisco. As many of us are descendants of settlers, immigrants, or descendants of those forcefully brought to this continent, we, CIS Public Programs, must recognize and never forget that our university's building in San Francisco occupies traditional, unceded Ramatush Ohlone lands. If you are interested in learning more about Native's lands, languages, and territories, we encourage you to visit native-land.ca. Now, let me first introduce our presenters, and then we'll get right to the conversation. In 2016, Matthew Siegel received his doctorate from the Philosophy, Cosmology, and Consciousness Program at CIIS. His work grapples with the limits to knowledge of reality imposed by transcendental philosophy and argues that a process-oriented approach shows the way across a Kantian threshold to renewed experiential contact with reality. He teaches courses on German idealism and process philosophy for the Philosophy, Cosmology, and Consciousness Program at CIIS. He blogs regularly at footnotestoplato.com. Jeremy Lent, described by The Guardian as one of the greatest thinkers of our age, is an author and speaker whose work investigates the underlying causes of our civilization's existential crisis and explores pathways towards a life-affirming future. His award-winning book, The Patterning Instinct, A Cultural History of Humanity's Search for Meaning, explores the way humans have made meaning from the cosmos from hunter-gatherer times to the present day. He is founder of the nonprofit Leology Institute, dedicated to fostering an integrated worldview that could enable humanity to thrive sustainably on the earth. He posts articles exploring political and cultural developments at patternsofmeaning.com. And now let me turn it over to Matthew and Jeremy. Thanks so much, Jason, and hello, Jeremy. It's great to be here with you tonight. Uh, and by here, uh, I mean, uh, because we're virtualized, um, on planet Earth, and people are joining us, I'm sure, from all around the country and the world. And um, it's it's a real honor to speak to you. This is your your second book, uh, The Web of Meaning, and I'm so excited to uh, ask you some questions about it and, and engage in some of the most important questions that our species has ever been faced with. So, <clears throat> welcome, Jeremy. Yeah, Good well, to be thanks with you. so much, Matt. Yeah, I'm I'm so happy to be here with you today. Looking forward to our conversation. Yeah, likewise. So, <clears throat> your book is about um, the stories, and on I mean, it's about a lot. But one of the things that it discusses is the stories that we tell ourselves, um, the worldview that has guided our modern civilization. But before we get to that collective story i want to ask you about your own personal journey and what it is that brought you as um what brought you out of the uh, the corporate world and a successful career um into mm. another successful career as as a writer uh and a thought leader who's engaged with the world crisis uh, how did that all transpire for you yeah you know um it was an interesting and unexpected kind of veering of my life path, if you will. Um, when I was actually uh, um, like a teenager and in my early 20s, I actually um, was pretty much in the same place I am now in terms of really looking for meaning and not accepting where, um, you know, what my society told me about. And I, I, I actually I grew up in England. <clears throat> um, but then um, when I was actually uh, to, when I was just finished with um, my undergraduate at Cambridge, and I just wanted to leave behind <clears throat> this place like Thatcher's England. I wanted to kind of explore the world. And what was so interesting is that what drew me to the United States was actually all these like videos of Woodstock, things like that from the 60s of people actually looking to understand, understand the universe, if you will. But what happened was I, I didn't realize I was landing in Reagan's America. And um, I ended up actually marrying somebody who had been a hippie and had traveled all over South America, um, but she wanted to, in her words, go straight. Uh, and, and so 
um, I did that with her and, um, and, uh, to, and she had two kids who wanted to give a good education to and all this kind of stuff. So I went and got an MBA of all places um, at the University of Chicago, the home of Milton Friedman uh, School of Thinking. Um, and, and so, yeah, that was what led to ha having this kind of successful business career. But then at a certain point in my life, things crashed around me. Um, my wife at the time, she passed away some years back, got very sick. I left the company that I'd started, uh, one of the first internet companies um, and taken public. I left that to look after her. And, and then I really lost um, my relationship with her, if you will, because she went through some cognitive decline. My company that I started collapsed. And it's like everything I'd built around my life collapsed around me. And then I really decided whatever I did with my life going forward, I wanted to be truly meaningful. But that was my question. Where did meaning actually come from? And that led me on this path of 10 or 15 years or so of actually trying to peel the layers of the onion, if you will, of meaning and trying to understand what was actually meaningful. And, and, and it was that path that led me to write first The Patting Instinct and then this book. And it wasn't initially my plan or my um, thought that it would look at how the world needs to be transformed. But the actual search for meaning itself brought me to this place of realizing how much we need to do to change our world right now. Mm. Mm. Wow. So, I mean, <clears throat> I think it sounds like you were confronted with, um, you know, some of the challenges that every human being ultimately has to face. Uh, whether it's our own death or the death of loved ones, and that this really catapulted you into asking uh, mm -hmm. these bigger civilization level questions. So this book is really the web of meaning. I have the US edition, and I got to say, um, just as an aside, that I really love the British, uh, the UK cover better, which <laughs> ironically has a Joshua tree on the cover, right? There you have it, which is native to the Southwest United States. So I feel like... <laughs> The UK version is kind of um, kind of stealing our local uh, <laughs> flora here. Um, I think both of us are in California. So in any event, um, let's, let's talk about worldview and um, the contemporary modern worldview um, is what your book is really aimed at addressing. And um, my question to sort of get the ball rolling here is why is that the level uh, at which you have aimed uh, your efforts? Mm -hmm. um, I don't think it's the only level that you would think is relevant, but some, um, for example, Karl Marx, maybe you have heard uh, of this fellow. He often would say that worldview and culture is kind of the superstructure and what's really driving um, our civilization, what shapes people's lives is the economic and material conditions, right? Um, there's not a total disconnect between the two, but for someone like Marx, he's a historical materialist. It's the, it's the material conditions that are driving things rather than the culture, which is sort of um, a, the superstructure that rides on top of the gears that are really making things happen. So why is it that you think addressing us mm. the crisis at the level of worldview is is so important? Yeah, well, you know, it's an interesting analogy <clears throat> that that idea of the structure and the superstructure. And I personally um, <clears throat> would view would see worldview not as the superstructure, but as the foundation. Mm. Um, <clears throat> and that's why I think it's so fundamental. Um, because really a worldview, if we want to kind of change um, metaphors a, a, a little bit, is really like the lens through which we see the world, through which we kind of pattern meaning into the world. And um, as I explored in detail in my um, earlier book, The Patterning Instinct, which is really a cultural history of humanity's search for meaning, and it looks at the different ways in which um, different cultural complexes have patterned meaning into the universe and how that led to their values. What came out of that book is this, um, this recognition that the values of a culture actually have shaped history. Um, and that by the same token, the values that we hold right now are what will ultimately shape our future. And that's why it's so critical to get that worldview correct. 
And you know, another way of uh, of looking at how to think about a, a worldview is really it, it's so powerful because we don't even realize that we have one. And just like a fish might swim in water and its whole life, it'll never know it's in water because that's all it knows. Most of us just live according to whatever our worldview implicitly tells us is reality and just assumes that's what it is. And that's why uh, it's so critical that once you actually begin to realize you're patterning meaning into the world around you in a certain way, it frees you to actually begin to look at different ways to pattern meaning into things. So I'd very much disagree with that um, sort of Marxian notion of culture as being the superstructure. I think that um, what it is, it, it's a little bit like um, superficial culture it can be it can look a little bit like the wallpaper. If you imagine some sort of Trump de Royal, you know, where you have some wallpaper that looks like it's the it's something beneath it, but that's all it is. That's the kind of culture maybe he was talking about. What I'm talking about is the fundamental way in which we make sense of things. Mm. Mm. And just to follow up on this question of worldview, you said that often we're swimming in it like, an, like a fish in water, we don't see it. How is it that, um, I mean, you, you sh told us a bit about how you came to recognize mm -hmm. that you exist within a worldview and that it needs to change. Um, are there ways other than how it transpired for you that uh, you think would allow people to become conscious of the worldview that they have uh, inherited and absorbed unconsciously mm. and then step into the work of actively working to uh, revise uh, that worldview if they find it to be yeah. faulty? Yeah, that's a, a great question. It seems to me that maybe there's two essential elements that could lead somebody to really changing their worldview. One of them is more like this deeply felt element, almost like a spiritual element, and a sense that something isn't quite right. It really is something akin to the Buddhist notion of dukkha, the sense of recognizing, coming into touch with some sense of dissatisfaction, something's wrong, um, and wanting to actually shift that. Um, and that can lead to all kinds of obviously spiritual growth. But in terms of worldview, I think there's another element that's needed too, which is a cognitive curiosity. Um, and the linkage between those two, a sense that something's wrong and a realization that it's got something to do with the reality that we are being told exists out there and a desire to start exploring. And, you know, for, for me, it took years, actually, of research um, in those earlier years I was talking about um, of looking at other worldviews um, to begin to realize that our worldview is not actually um, just this kind of given reality. And then to realize it's not even scientifically true. Um, and that's what was, to me, one of the biggest kind of shocks, if you will, as it began to unfold, and something I really tried to focus on, take people through in this new book. So the worldview that you're critiquing in this book is the, um, the mechanistic, reductionistic view of the universe that mm -hmm. um, comes out of Europe in the modern period, right. and kind of spreads around the world, um, not peacefully, uh, but through mm -hmm. colonization often. And um, tell us about this, this worldview. Um, why is it so destructive? And also, as you mentioned in your book, um, how has it, how is it double-edged in the sense that it's also brought some, some gifts? I mean, you draw on science a lot in this book yeah. to bring forth this new worldview, but it's a different kind of science. So lead mm -hmm. us through that, that historical journey of the rise of science and this mechanistic view and the transition into um, a more interconnected understanding coming out of a new form of science. Right, yes, absolutely. Because a, a, key, a key theme in the book and something we, or we can come to in a minute is that science and reductionism are by no means the same thing. And so let's just sort of keep that up there and, and come back to that. Um, <clears throat> but so really to answer the core of your question, I think the key element of the worldview that I think is so destructive um, and also actually leads to some of the positive uh, outcomes that it has um, is that it's a worldview of separation. And that is a, is a key element. And it's a worldview that basically says, and it, in my view, it came from the, the ancient Greeks, even though I know um, you and I might not see things exactly in that lineage or whatever, 
but there was this this and um, what got inherited into Christianity, in my understanding, is the sense of a split universe, basically, like a sense of a, a heaven um, <clears throat> somewhere outside of the world, um, and this kind of uh, world right here. And that split cosmos also uh, was aligned with a sense of a split human being, a sense of uh, a person having a soul separate from the body, and this kind of idea that the soul um, was actually imprisoned in the body. And then in, in Christianity, this kind of sense that um, the body was almost like this minefield that was uh, that could stop your soul getting to heaven. So that was this key separation which desacralized the natural world so that the source of divinity, the source of what is um, sacred and important was seen to be outside the living earth. And it was, I mean, what I, what I find so interesting is that it was Christianity that actually incubated the scientific revolution. We're so used nowadays to thinking of this battle between science and Christianity, but it was the very, that very sense of separation that led <clears throat> this kind of deification of reason um, in the early Christian era. And it was, it was that part of it which led those founders of the scientific revolution, people like Galileo and Newton and Descartes, to feel they were doing God's work in using their reason to sort of decipher this incredibly complex machine that was nature. And really, I think it was Descartes that did the, probably had the most impact in setting the modern world into the path it was on <laughs> with his what, what he did is he basically took the old Christian notion of soul and kind of reformulated it as mind. Um, so, you know, in his famous statement, uh, cogito ergo sum, I think therefore I am. What that led to was this identity of the, the true human being with just that thinking faculty, um, with the idea that the rest of nature basically didn't have that sense of true identity. It was just a machine in his, in his view. And even our bodies were just this kind of machine housing our true soul or our true mind. That's led to both to the positive outcome of uh, this notion of when you start to see nature as a machine, well, you start to try to break it apart to see how the little parts work, which led to so much of the positive progress that came with the scientific revolution in understanding the world. <clears throat> but it also led to this sense of seeing the rest of nature as a resource for exploitation. And I, I think it's no coincidence, in fact, that right in that same period in Europe, right around the 17th century, we see not just the scientific revolution and the rise in reductionist science, but we also see um, the very, the beginnings of colonialism. We see the beginnings of uh, whiteness and the, and the beginnings of white supremacy. We see the beginnings of capitalism and the first, the, the, the very first uh, shareholder owned corporations got, um, got started right around that same time. Because if you look at each of those different um, things that unfolded, every one of them came around from this place of exploitation, seeing what was outside your own identity as being like a resource to exploit, to extract value from, rather than something you're connected with. Mm -hmm. And so you trace this history um, in your book, mm -hmm. but you also, um, you know, as I mentioned, you draw upon I guess what we could call the new paradigm sciences, which uh, are attempting to leave the, the Cartesian and Newtonian origins of European science behind to, I mean, I guess they're still inheriting this uh, mathematical precision and the empirical rigor and so on. Mm -hmm. But those very tools, after a few hundred years of research have uh, really undermined this mechanistic mm -hmm. picture of nature. And so in your book, you talk about neuroscience systems theory, uh, this uh, understanding of biological evolution that is no longer merely a kind of um, competitive struggle among individuals, but biologists are beginning to recognize the, the role of symbiosis. Lynn Margulis, the famous biologist, talked about symbiogenesis, the way that new species are actually brought forth through a process of sharing genetic material and, and whole uh, 
free living cells can be merged into um, other cells to create organisms of greater complexity. And so can you describe a bit how science uh, has, has begun to open up to a different form of uh, worldview ultimately, one that's rooted mm -hmm. in this connectivity rather than the sense of separation out of which it initially emerged. Yeah, well, perhaps the best way to start looking at that is to look at the actual distinction between science itself and this reductionist worldview. Because even though most people tend to conflate that, it, it, we, we sort of think of it just in normal conversation as though they're the same thing. But if, if, we, if we look at what science actually is, it's really like, <clears throat> um, it's a methodology and, and it also has its own, it's, it's really a value system of itself. Like it values things like <clears throat> honesty, transparency, um, being evidence-based, um, empiricism. The, there's a, a number of things about science which, <clears throat> which truly has its own values. Um, and when we look at reductionism, that's really one uh, uh, sort of method that is used within science to try to answer a lot of questions about things. But what I see happening, what I, I believe happened with reductionism is it was so successful at actually answering questions about the universe, whether in physics or chemistry or biology, that over time scientists um, <clears throat> who followed that path begin, began to think that reductionism could explain not just a lot of stuff about the universe, but everything about the universe. And not just that it could explain everything about the universe, but that any other form of explanation that didn't follow reductionism was necessarily invalid. Now, um, in the book, I, I call this an ontological leap. Um, really, I call it ontological reductionism. And I believe that it's a leap of faith, pretty much as big as a leap of faith of somebody saying, I believe in God and God created the, um, the universe in, in six days and, or whatever, because <clears throat> there's no reason why reductionism could be used to explain everything about the universe. And what these other uh, new sciences of uh, connection, really, I think for them, uh, like, like you say, systems thinking, but systems biology also, network theory, any science that looks at the connections between things. And <clears throat> what they tend to lead to is this recognition that actually there are multiple layers of explanation in the real world. So sciences like these, they don't reject reductionism in the slightest. They build on reductionism. But, and, and so they're, they're not like some sort of spiritual woo-woo of saying like, oh, there's some other reality out there that reductionism isn't looking at. But they say, in addition to the reductionist components of what makes our world happen, there are also a components of self-organization. And when you study these components of self-organization, you recognize that oftentimes self-organized systems lead to um, <clears throat> higher levels of complexity, which uh, can be described as emergence, where at that new level of complexity, <clears throat> you need to come up with new ways of actually understanding how that new extra complex system works than you could have through just looking at the parts alone at the bottom of that system. It's simple. It's like, so it's complementary to reductionism. It's not instead of. Right, so there's this new recognition that evolution, whether biological or in the broader sense, cosmological, looking at the entire history of the universe is a process whereby uh, more complex holes are emerging that are not reducible to the behavior of the parts, right? That uh, yes. the properties <clears throat> manifest at the, at the level of the whole. And, and I'd add, yes, exactly. I'd add one um, other really critical part to this, which is that the, the, the observation of these elements is not, <clears throat> cannot be essentially separated from me doing the observing. So this is a key element here because we begin to look at um, really a, a sense of things emerging at the level of my perception of something else causes that new um, a, a new level of understanding uh, or a new system of complexity to emerge. And in fact, when you look at some of the key concepts in life, which I explore in the book, whether it's life itself or consciousness 
or meaning or any of these sort of really big uh, concepts, we find that they're actually um, concepts that get enacted um, through interactions between different components. And it's only, it's the enactment itself that is the reality rather than the actual individual pieces. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, so whereas the early mechanistic form of science had this um, God's eye view perspective on nature as if the scientist was outside of the world looking in, mm -hmm. the new sciences, whether it's complexity theory or uh, quantum theory, of course, is bringing the observer back into uh, the context of the natural world as um, one of the, um, the entities in relationship to what's being studied so that there's this recognition of a participatory role that the right. scientist as an observer is playing in what is being observed, right? Exactly. <clears throat> and even a, um, a participatory role in, <clears throat> um, in the very concepts itself, things like consciousness, uh, these sciences lead us to recognize that that in itself is enacted, that we participate in consciousness. It's not something that arises somewhere else. Right. It, I mean, when we do investigate nature scientifically, consciousness, we, I think human beings, including our consciousness, we're part of nature. It becomes very obvious, impossible to ignore the participatory dimension of the study of our own consciousness. Right. Um, it's a little bit easier to think of the biological world as something out there, but even there, it's already like it's our own bodies we're talking about mm. to some extent. Physics, of course, is the paradigm um, out of which modern science emerged. I mean, the, the, the idea that we could study the inanimate natural world as though it were merely a collection of objects out there that we can carefully measure. I mean, that's what science was born on, this, this um, methodology that took the subject out of the picture and just looked at the measurable objects, right? Matter in motion, it could be studied mathematically. And that was really exciting. But as more progress was made in physics in the early 20th century, you know, um, quantum theory was born, relativity theory was born, each in their own way are bringing the observer back into uh, the, 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 the matter in motion that's being studied in a way that forever problematizes any attempt to get a view from nowhere, right? Mm, exactly. So given this um, interrelationality, given this, the, the interconnectivity uh, that science has uncovered, um, given the participatory dimension of science, it's no surprise that many, um, many writers and thinkers have made analogies between these new sciences and various forms of spirituality, Eastern spirituality in particular, whether Buddhism or Taoism, um, you discuss those as well as Neo-Confucian Neo philosophy in your book. Mm -hmm. And so um, when we do make these sorts of comparisons between new paradigm science and spirituality, um, well, first of all, I want you to talk a bit about why those analogies is, are so tempting, um, but because the resonances are very striking indeed. But I also wanna ask you to reflect on any potential dangers here because on the one hand, we're talking about timeless spiritual um, insights, right? When we draw on the world's wisdom traditions, um, there's something that is unlikely to change about their value and their truth. Whereas mm -hmm. on the other hand, science as a methodology, as you said, um, is constantly, um, it's not a collection of finished knowledge. It's constantly challenging itself. New paradigms are being born all the time. And so what happens if we make too close of a link between a particular scientific paradigm right. and this spiritual insight when science changes its mm -hmm. mind? Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. <clears throat> That's a super important question. And um, so first, why don't we look at what I explore in the book um, as the confluences and the value that, look, um, that arises from that? And then uh, look at that second issue, which is what are the dangers um, <clears throat> involved in going uh, in, in that direction um, to be aware of? So first off, I think when we look at <clears throat> the 
relation between these two things, like what, what science tells us and what uh, spiritual traditions tell us. I think <clears throat> maybe uh, I'd like to kind of share the <clears throat> sort of discovery that I made as I was in the middle of doing all this kind of research year after year, trying to figure <clears throat> some of these things out. Because um, I, I was sort of just beginning to um, <clears throat> begin to see that like re reduction of science was not all there was about science and going deep into complexity theory and other s systems thinking and stuff like that. Um, and one of the great writers in this area is actually his name is um, Stuart Kaufman. And he, he writes um, books, he's, he's from the Santa Fe Institute. He writes books with titles, things like At Home in the Universe, like looking at how the, the new understanding of physics can uh, show uh, how connected we are, things like that. And he writes in this book something about how um, we're looking at these new principles of life and new principles of meaning. And he says, we're kind of beginning to explore new territory um, that has never been explored before. And we need to find out the sort of principles around that. Great words. But meanwhile, at the same time, I'd been reading a lot <coughs> of, or, and going quite deep into these East Asian ways of thinking. And I, did, I was reading a lot about these neo-Confucian philosophers. And most of us in the West know almost nothing about neo-Confucianism. It sounds like some sort of boring academic subject uh, that <clears throat> maybe Sinophiles want to study or whatever. It's actually this amazing group of sages about a thousand years ago in the Song Dynasty in China, who basically synthesized um, <clears throat> some of the, th the threads of the millennia previous in China from Taoism, um, and Buddhism and Confucianism, um, and that's if we call them Neo-Confucianism. They call them they call themselves as the study of the school of the Tao. But what they uh, when they try to make us a, a systematic understanding of the cosmos, they looked at it as being comprised of of qi, but also of li, which they described as the organizing principles that connected everything around uh, the the qi. And I began to realize, wow, what Stuart Kaufman feels like we've never been exploring before, these organizing principles of nature have actually been explored, not according to our scientific methodology, but according to other ways of human relating to um, by all these different traditions. They basically were exploring the lead, these organizing principles. And then I began to realize that actually <clears throat> when, when science, when reductionist science and tells us that basically there is no meaning to the universe. There's no value, like that science is basically just looking at the, the sort of all these billiard balls um, hitting each other. <clears throat> that once we start to look at those connecting principles, we see that this split that we have in our Western worldview is no longer valid, that there is no longer the split between mind and body. There is no longer the split basically between spiritual understanding and scientific understanding. And, and so, you know, so many times people in the West go like, well, I, I believe in science, you know, I, um, and so I have these spiritual ideas, but that's in some sort of domain separate from my scientific understanding. And, you know, it's just recognize, well, we just got to like not integrate them. But I realized that actually through this other understanding, all of those elements of our human experience could truly be integrated. And in many ways, that's what this book, The Web of Meaning is about. It's about um, <clears throat> the process of integrating the different elements of life <clears throat> that we have ac been accustomed to think are separate which involves integrating um, wisdom traditions from the past with, the, with modern understanding, integrating spirituality with science, um, integrating humans with the rest of life. In each of these ways, integrating refers, not just kind of squishing it all together, but looking at how everything is actually unified while differentiated in this kind of complex, essentially this complex web of meaning. So that, that's kind of my experience sort of a description of what I see as positive. But let's get to your, your point about <clears throat> are there negatives to this? And <clears throat> yeah, I think that there's always a danger of looking at one particular scientific insight and saying, okay, this is now we know that, now we know what um, uh, spiritual wisdom is truly about or something like that. And so oftentimes I get concerned when people look at um, sort of deep physics 
to explain spirituality. Um, because that's where I, I have the same concern that you were just describing. Well, what happens, you know, if somebody says, you know, what physics tells us is there are no elemental particles, it's all just um, vibrations of, string, uh, of strings and string theory. Well, that all sounds great. And that would be a lovely way to say, okay, well, this kind of shows that the connections between things are more important than the things themselves. But what happens if 10 years from now, some new physicist shows like, oh, string, string theory is wrong. Actually, there is some fundamental particle of particles that, you know, and, and I think that's what's dangerous. What I'm looking at is something very different. It's looking at more like a way of perceiving reality. And, and it's simply this recognition that modern uh, complexity theory, systems thinking, et cetera, has, is, is that when we look at the world, oftentimes the relationship between things very often are more important than the things themselves. That's a principle which applies underlying systems thinking and <clears throat> applies very much to spiritual traditions like Buddhism, Taoism, or Neo-Confucianism. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Um, so as someone who, as Jason mentioned in my intro, I study, uh, I have studied the Western tradition primarily, though of course I've been enriched uh, by my study of Taoism and Buddhism. I have not studied uh, Confucianism as much, and so I did learn a lot uh, from your work, and so I thank you for that. Um, but, you know, I, a lot of my efforts um, are to retrieve these aspects of the, um, the Greek philosophical uh, and Christian and Jewish, um, just because of my own lineage and inheritance, uh, religious and spiritual and philosophical traditions. And um, you, you also mentioned Carl Jung in your book, and he's a, the death psychologist. His work has been important for me, and he's someone that uh, in working with um, Freud, who was his mentor and teacher for a while, uh, developed this new method of death psychology to help, in a way, you could say surface the worldview that Westerners had taken for granted. And Jung did individual therapy, but he also had a lot to tell us about our the collective unconscious and uh, the complexes and the um, the psychoses really that affect us at a collective level. And one of the things that Jung warned about was in speaking to Europeans and Americans, but mostly Europeans, um, he was worried that there was this tendency to look to the most elite esoteric traditions of the East um, and to import their views and practices. And what worried Jung was that, you know, we have our own inheritances, our own the archetypal patterns working within our psyche that might not necessarily um, be compatible, at least initially. And, you know, this was almost a century ago now that he, he began warning about this. And so I guess I felt like there were times in your book where in um, celebrating the, the, the wisdom and insight of uh, the Neo-Confucians that, and, and kind of um, looking at Plato's dualism, say, or the way that Christianity tends to em emphasize the afterlife rather than the earthly plane, all of which is, is perfectly true and a valid critique. But there are other lineages in this Western stream that I think mitigate against the dominant stream. And I guess, Following Jung's concerns, the question I want to put to you is, is there any risk in um, so uh, kind of vilifying our own um, inheritances as Westerners that we end up disemboweling ourselves? Mm -hmm. And is there any hope for trying to, to, to redeem and revise and, and build upon resources within our traditions in dialogue with all the world's traditions from Asia, indigenous traditions and so on you need to be planetary so you know don't get me wrong mm -hmm. it's not like i'm trying to say we should just return to the european lineages or anything but is there any sense in which we can um draw upon the wisdom of of the west as well in this conversation as we move into um, a more interconnected worldview oh yes i i think absolutely um and really uh I try to be really clear in the book <clears throat> that in no way 
am I <clears throat> trying to kind of attack the Western worldview or say and there's something um, wrong with it and um, essentially um, I mean for, for starters um, as, as we've sort of touched on a little bit um, the it's a worldview that's brought to us science um, and it's a worldview that has brought to us all this incredible technology um, so much of it has been so life enhancing and, and so enhancing the quality of human life um, it's a worldview that's also brought concepts um, into the sort of global consciousness, things like um, human rights or um, things like uh, freedom or democracy. M many of these big concepts arose out of enlightenment thinking, and it's something to be absolutely celebrated. So it's not like um, I feel like there's a, a good bad thing going on, like, oh, we've got to turn to the better um, East Asian traditions or anything like that. But it's more that, uh, to your point, we need to develop a planetary consciousness. We're facing really the greatest crisis that humanity has probably ever faced. Maybe um, <clears throat> there was a time before we left Africa when we were maybe going down to a few tens of thousands of uh, individuals, and maybe there was a crisis going on there. Since uh, any time since then, this is a massive crisis we are facing. And we need all the resources that our human lineage can give us. That means we need the scientific resources. We need the resources of the great wisdom traditions from around the world. We need the resources from indigenous traditions that have maintained a closer connection <clears throat> with some of the core human uh, um, like ways of living that got lost as agriculture developed and as uh, science developed, et cetera. So we need everything we can get. But at the same time, we have to avoid this kind of squishing it all together. And, you know, to the issue you raise, uh, that Jung raised, and I, I, we can see that in this um, sort of blind path, if you will, of Orientalism. There was this you know, great book, obviously, um, written by Edward Said um, decades ago, uh, really critiquing just how there's been this whole history in the West of romanticizing the East. And then, um, and then creating a new bifurcation, like, oh, the West is rational, the East is spiritual, and all this kind of claptrap, right, that um, people get caught up in. And we see a lot of that still today in New Age thinking. There's um, so many people who just, you know, because somebody puts himself up as a guru and they walk around in saffron, they must have some insight into something and all this, all this stuff. That is not what I'm suggesting and not where I'm going. Um, but I believe that... Um, if we try to take a truly integrative approach and try to look at the best insights we can from these different traditions, we're able to actually really build a worldview, a set of a platform, if you will, that could lead humanity into a totally different phase of our human existence, one that actually integrates well, in the su subtitle of my book is Integrating Science and Traditional Wisdom to Find Our Place in the Universe. And I believe it's possible to integrate science with traditional wisdom to actually not just find humanity's place, but to move humanity as a global um, species into a relationship with the earth, a relationship with ourselves that could truly lead to flourishing. That's the path I think is possible. Yeah, thank you for that, Jeremy. And just to, to pick on, on up on this thread of the importance of developing a planetary consciousness, a planetary worldview um, that doesn't just mush everything together, mm -hmm. that respects the diversity of the world's various traditions and peoples, um, and yet also is at least gesturing towards um, our common predicament, um, which is that we are all members of an Earth community that is increasingly imperiled because of um, particular worldview, which we've been discussing. Um, I think in our particular moment, we're, I don't even know, almost two years now into this COVID-19 <laughs> pandemic. And in a way, um, we're seeing how science really does provide us with a, a method and a language and a means of connecting across continents. Um, we all recognize the same phenomenon, um, this virus, we're all trying to mitigate it. And yet there's such, at the same time that we have this 
scientific knowledge that's helping us address the crisis, um, there's a, a lot of resistance to the, um, there, are, there are concerns I would say about the imposition of state power and corporate power, big pharma and so on, to, to manage the narrative, to make sure that everyone is following the science. And I think before we had COVID-19 and the pandemic, there was climate change, which similarly science, no matter what, your, what language you speak, what continent you live on, if there are scientists there, they research the climate, they study meteorology, the composition of the atmosphere, and they all agree this is not good, right? But there's similarly a lot of resistance to this, hope we would hope universal scientific understanding. And so I guess, I think you started writing this before the pandemic started. Right. But given the situation that we're in, the role of medical science in addressing the crisis we're facing and the resistance to that narrative, how do you think your work can help address the situation? I know that's a big ask. I mean, but, you know, given our current situation, what is it that addressing this at the level of worldview can um, bring to the table that maybe isn't part of our regular discussion about it? <clears throat> well, I think that the when we're looking not just at uh, <clears throat> at the COVID nineteen situation, but um, fundamentally, it's the the climate crisis is just massive and you know it, just this week the ipcc came out with this report saying yeah it, we're probably already unless we really change um so much where uh yeah we're going to blow that one and a half degrees celsius number within um a decade or more and 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 we're headed <clears throat> um quite potentially to the real threats of our civilization itself uh, st staying around before the center is out. And here's what, what, what's so fascinating. And this, I think, is a, is a way to come at this, realizing how worldview is so important. If you look at those different climate models that the IPCC has put, has put out, <clears throat> that have been studied now for years, you know, a, a, aggressive, a, a, like the best case and the worst case, everything else, Every one of those climate models assumed a continued increase year by year in gross domestic product around the world. Nobody even took it as a question that maybe that's a variable that can actually be impacted by actually moving to a degrowth or a post-growth situation for the world. And that shows how powerful worldviews are. The current worldview takes it as a given that you have to keep growing um, basically, in an, uh, like on a finite planet at an exponential rate, year after year after year. That's what is underlying the way in which we're destructing, uh, in which we're destroying ecosystems around the world. That even climate breakdown itself is just a symptom of an even larger problem the sort of ecological devastation that our civilization is causing by looking at the natural world as a resource. So then even the more sort of quote unquote enlightened people coming from that worldview will say things like, <clears throat> we need to look at a more sustainable path so we can keep exploiting nature, um, you know, uh, more sustainably, basically, rather than looking at recognizing our connectedness with all of life, which leads to a fundamentally different way of looking at relating to these problems, rather than saying, oh, let's do geoengineering, treat the earth as this kind of machine that went wrong, just so we can keep growing uh, our GDP even more um, over the next few decades, start to look at what are we doing in the system of humanity with a living earth? How can we actually shift our direction to start to regenerate the earth, not just keep it sustainable, but regenerate it? And how can we actually look at this symbiotic flourishing between humans within our human society and, and then between humans in the living earth in a way that we can actually learn from life's own lessons, basically, to find a, a, way, a way forward that is and that doesn't involve this kind of insanity that we're on right now. So <clears throat> this is my, my sense of why a, vo a worldview is so fundamental, but actually has very specific outcomes when you actually start looking at things in a, in a different way. Mm -hmm. Do you have a sense for why 
uh, some pockets of, of society. Uh, I mean, it's, it's more close to home for me here in America. Um, there are a lot of people who resist this transition to a new worldview. And there's a lot of fear um, about what it is exactly that these green ecological spiritual people are trying to, to bring into the world. What's this, is this resistance just a matter of fear of the unknown or what, what is being tapped mm. into here that's causing such resistance? Yeah, <clears throat> well, you know, when you talk about re resistance to this new worldview, I actually think of two different pockets of resistance, if you will. Um, <clears throat> I, I can't really call them pockets. They're more like <laughs> bigger domains of resistance. Well-funded domains of resistance. <laughs> right, <laughs> but I mean, one, one fascinating one is actually from, reductionist thinking people themselves. Um, and it's actually quite fascinating. Um, I've, I've experienced this myself where I've written um, articles critiquing Richard Dawkins and the selfish gene theory and looking at the connection between that and the sort of notion, the Gordon Gecko greed is good notion of capitalism. And I found myself bombarded by literally like a thousand or more um, sort of comments in, in one or more of these articles, really ad hominem, a, a little bit like um, this, um, you would expect maybe from right-wing fundamentalists or whatever, rather than from uh, sort of scientific minded people. So that's in itself is quite fascinating. And I think there you need to look at the sort of Thomas Kuhn understanding of the <clears throat> of paradigm shift and the realization that when people have dedicated their lives um, <clears throat> and built that prestige and reputation on a particular way of thinking, it's very difficult. It takes tremendous courage um, and incredible open-mindedness for them not to just double down and defend their point of view against what they see as being as an, an attack. So that's kind of one domain. But then I think you're probably referring more to what we see in, in the politics of the United States and basically all around the world is groups of people just feeling that their whole, everything is being taken away from them by progressive forces and reacting so strongly against it with this rise in right-wing extremism and everything that's so damaging right now. <clears throat> but I think that's a very different uh, understanding of this, of that kind of resistance. There, I think, what you simply need to look at is the rise in the neoliberal ideology of the last few decades and this incredible rise in equality where basically um, the not just wealth, but the very basics for any kind of um, economic or physical security have been sucked up from the mass of people towards these elites. <clears throat> and it's not just the wealth and the economics itself, but the very sense of meaning. Um, <clears throat> meaning itself has been uh, sort of under attack, if you will, in the West for over 100 years with the rise of consumerism. But at least even consumerism gave, and gave some level of meaning to people in, uh, in, in their communities or whatever. But when even that has been like uh, blown away by this um, by this kind of ravaging from this breakdown in our sort of social contract. What has happened, I think, is the elites don't want people to all go around saying, oh, this is really unfair. If there's something wrong about <clears throat> like a mega billionaire having $100 billion. Well, and um, you know, millions of people are scrambling to even just uh, put a roof over their head or just get enough to eat. They don't want people to think that. So they simply deflect the attention to threats that seem to be closer at hand, like immigrants or um, <clears throat> these uh, the snowflakes who are trying to undermine your, you know, um, your sense of um, sort of male, uh, your, you know, your place in the patriarchy and all this kind of stuff. So there we see, I, I believe, quite um, cynical and conscious um, approaches by the corporate owned media to actually just make news out of stuff that isn't news in order to deflect people's attention from what's really going on. Right, right. Yeah, um, so we have about 10 minutes remaining before we open up for questions. And I wanna just, I know people are probably being reminded already on YouTube, but please do be sure to submit your questions. We look forward to receiving those. Um, 
I'm going to go with, with this question for you, Jeremy. It's not an easy one, um, but it's a question about morality and uh, whether or not it is intrinsic to human nature uh, in the sense that it's in some way evolved as um, we have learned to be more social creatures. This is something you discuss in your book, this notion of group selection, which uh, is a... Um, an approach that's not the Dawkins selfish gene, every individual for themselves kind of approach, but it recognizes that there are multiple levels of selection and that one of them has to do with um, group bonding. And that mm -hmm. one idea is that our sense of um, fairness and justice and, and morality comes out of this is kind of an evolutionary process. But I wonder if you think the good, which is, a term that Plato develops, right? That refers for him to this highest notion, like he analogizes it to the sun and it just says this, as, as the, the sun provides light that shines, that illuminates everything else. The good is um, the source of uh, our conscience, our sense of what's virtuous to do and how we ought to behave. Do you think that this is something which is a function of sort of the contingencies of group selection in our species evolutionary history? Or do you, do you find any basis for the notion that somehow the good was like written into the fabric of the cosmos from the get-go? Does this mm. question make sense? Does it, is the good something that emerged in mm. the course of evolution due to natural selection or group selection? Or is it something deeper that's actually guiding our evolution along the way? <laughs> yeah, <clears throat> I mean, profound question. And, uh, and ultimately, it, it's like this question about values, right? And I mean, are values ultimately relative? <clears throat> or is there um, some sort of a foundation to values? Um, and if there's a foundation, wh where do we find it? Um, <clears throat> and well, I think a lot of, and I explore this in the book, in fact, um, uh, there's a chapter in the book called Culti Cultivating Integrated Values, um, where I look at many of these ways in which it's so complex looking at values because people come at from some such different places. And I think that um, <clears throat> the when we like look deeper and deeper at where these layers come from, one of the things that I look at is that in a way we can understand value itself <clears throat> as arising with life. Um, <clears throat> that if we just kind of imagine for a moment a well, a, a universe where there is no life whatsoever, um, then maybe those reductionist I, ontologist, <laughs> ontological reduction is not so wrong. There is just a bunch of lots of billiard balls hitting each other and doesn't really matter. Um, <clears throat> what happens to them. But as soon as life emerged on this planet, uh, uh, roughly 4 billion years ago, uh, when people look at try to understand what life is about, um, <clears throat> what, they, uh, what they have come to recognize as the source of life is this kind of self-organized process of <clears throat> really um, moving against entropy. So you know, we, we know entropy is you know, coming from the second law of thermodynamics, that basically, ultimately, the universe will just kind of um, go through this heat death, you know, many billions of years into the future. And entropy is this kind of notion that um, <clears throat> once things begin to dissipate, you can't sort of bring them back again. You can't, once you break an egg, you can't sort of get the yolk back, et cetera. Um, <clears throat> and the record, this understanding of life that's developed now in the last few decades is that actually life is in a way like a local reversal of entropy. That what life actually does is sort of take entropy in and organizes it inside a membrane. Um, it self-organizes it and does a, a reversal of entropy. And what we understand, the reason I think value arose at that point is that those early proto cells that started to do that had to make value judgments. Like, is something they're bringing in actually going to help them to maintain this reversal of entropy or not? And they began to say, we don't, that's a bad molecule. That's not going to help us. This one will really help us. Um, of course, they couldn't speak or think about it at the time, but that's what was going on. 
And so if you look at life in that way, we get, we get to see life itself as this actually nearly 4 billion years of this unfolding of increasingly rich, diverse form uh, like a, a, of negative entropy locally happening on Earth. And that is, you can see there almost from the point of view of complexity. So, and if to almost like the ways in which things organize being more and more complex in the sense that they reverse entropy even more efficiently and effectively than had been done before. And if we begin to look at values coming from that, well, that leads to very much to this kind of life affirming set of values. We could get to realize that we, each of us ourselves with our 40 trillion cells are just one part of this amazing story of life unfolding in its richness over these billions of years. We're all part of life. We all are life as part of this unfolding. So, and to me, that, that leads to <clears throat> this, this sense that I think was best actually described by <clears throat> Albert Schweitzer, a 20th century humanitarian, who said, I am life that wills to live in the midst of life that wills to live. <clears throat> and he himself said, like, you know, from that, the having reverence for life is the foundation point of morality. And that's pretty much where I come, where I come from, and or at least where I come to and in my own exploration and in the book itself is that <clears throat> and values, if we see values as fundamentally starting from life itself, that's values that can celebrate um, the integration and the diversity of life, celebrate all the different ways in which humans can like do what we do, but fundamentally um, <clears throat> celebrate that within the context of life. And it begins to lean towards saying things that destroy the richness of life are um, inherently wrong. Yeah, it's so <laughs> profoundly important, I think, to be able to uh, expand the circle of value out beyond just the human sphere. Um, I mean, under neoliberal capitalism, it's not just, it's even narrower than that. I mean, a lot of human values, the, the value of human flourishing is not really considered um, essential to GDP. Um, right. And so this expansion of value beyond just what say shareholders value right. beyond uh, you know, just what's going to make a profit, but um, a conception of value that includes the whole biosphere and the, the, the preciousness and the fragility of life on this planet um, where we can begin to acknowledge that even if there's no use for it in the human economy, um, this species, this uh, individual, you know, ecosystem um, has a value intrinsic to 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 itself, exactly. just by virtue of its existence of as a living being or a community of mm -hmm. living beings. Um, exactly. I think that's it's a profound expansion of our conception, mm -hmm. our modern Western conception of value. Um, so important. So I, I really am grateful to you for articulating it in such a clear, accessible, and powerful and exciting way in your book. Um, if we had more time, I'd, I'd want to ask more cosmological questions about the place of life mm. in, in the evolution of the whole universe and mm -hmm. the, the complexification of matter for billions of years before the earth solidified and the complex chemistry that gave rise to biological life forms was possible. I think there's mm. an interesting story to be told about the potential for value to precede even the emergence of life. Mm -hmm. um, but we'll have to save that for a different time. I want to uh, make sure we have plenty of time for the great, the great questions that are coming in here. Are you ready to, to turn to those questions from the Absolutely. audience? Absolutely. Look forward to it. <clears throat> <clears throat> so this one is anonymous. Um, this, question, uh, this questioner asks, um, what can we do to expand the domain of empiricism to include the faculty of mental perception in addition to the five physical senses? Hmm. <clears throat> That's interesting. Um, yeah, I wonder <clears throat> what is meant by um, mental <clears throat> perception in the question. Um, I'd hazard a guess <clears throat> that, you know, at least what comes to my mind is, um, the some of the teachings from Buddhism, <clears throat> when we um, 
sort of first learn about meditation. And um, <clears throat> there's this recognition of um, one tends to like perceive uh, senses and what do you hear, what do you feel? Um, <clears throat> and then there's this recognition of like mental objects, like what are the mental objects that arise in consciousness? Um, and <clears throat> I actually feel that um, there's this great tradition within Buddhism of empiricism relating to that internal investigation of, of mental objects, uh, mm -hmm. <clears throat> which in, you know, to uh, disc uh, when I was defining sort of science before, as opposed to reductionism, I'd say it really uh, fits many of the criteria of science to really kind of investigate um, and recognize <clears throat> that so many of those sort of mental objects we see, we tell stories about, and then using um, a deep empirical approach to recognize, oh, I've, I'm actually making a story about that. What happens if I sort of peel the layer on that story and go deeper and deeper? And I feel <clears throat> that that is an internal investigation that does meet the levels of uh, the, the criteria of empiricism uh, <clears throat> that actually looks at uh, the sort of mental uh, perception, um, really as a sense in itself, as a, as a way to understand our consciousness. And, and through that, the way in which our consciousness is perceiving reality. That's right. Yeah. I don't yeah. know if you have any thoughts about that, Matt. Um, yeah. Well, I appreciate your turn to, to Buddhism. Um, I, I do, I, I have appreciated um, this understanding that comes out of some schools of thought in, in Buddhism about the mind as itself a sense. Mm -hmm. um, and in the West, in the, the European scientific tradition, going back to the 17th century with Galileo, to be empirical required um, being able to quantitatively measure something. Uh, and so to bring in the interior dimensions um, to that sort of a study is just you know, you can ask someone from one to 10, how much pain are you feeling? But it's inherently going to be a bit su uh, subjective and qualitative. And so the question is really, um, how can we bring quality back into science and not just have it be about quantity and the measurement of quantities? Um, and, you know, there is um, in the West, a whole school of philosophy called phenomenology, uh, that comes out of the work of thinkers like Edmund Husserl. Um, but there's also um, in the American tradition, something called radical empiricism that comes out of William James's work. And for someone like James, he was a psychologist. Uh, he's very interested in the natural sciences and the study of the exterior of nature, but he was also interested in the interior of nature, which is our own consciousness. And so for James, he would apply an empirical, a radically empirical method to psychology, to religious experience and so on. Mm -hmm. And so there are examples of how mm -hmm. we can bring a scientific mm -hmm. approach, scientific rigor to these interior domains, mm -hmm. but it's a different kind of science. And I think it's part of the new worldview um, that, that you're discussing so much in your book and that we've went over, we've gone over tonight um, is just expanding our conception of science so that it includes relationship it includes um, consciousness and the participatory role of consciousness and so I definitely think there's there's room to to for science to grow in this way mm -hmm. so next we have a question from Susan Curry and Susan asks what are your thoughts on quantum reality as it relates to awakening this worldview of interconnectedness. So we touched on this a bit, but maybe mm -hmm. this is an opportunity to go a bit deeper. Yeah. <clears throat> um, and so, yeah, when, when we were talking about this before, <clears throat> this would maybe falls into that category of, um, well, maybe we need to be a little careful about building too much on that understanding, given that, you know, every decade or so, um, you know, the great um, research in, in physics, like some, some of the, the great physicists are uncovering different ways of understanding things. <clears throat> and there may be a time when people look back and say, oh God, can you believe there was that, that, that century when people talked about quantum reality as if it was the ultimate whatever. Um, but I do think <clears throat> um, there, that does lead to this kind of question about consciousness, which I think we've been sort of 
almost touching into a few times in, in this conversation, which is uh, just this level, this layer of, well, is there, is like, is the universe itself conscious, you know, it, or um, is, is consciousness a function of something that's embodied or uh, where, where does that um, come from? And actually, if you look at um, some research in neuroscience, um, you find um, really interestingly, there's a, a particular researcher called Giulio Tononi um, has come up with this like integrated um, information theory of consciousness, which is basically looking at saying that if you look at any system um, and you look at any um, information in that system above and beyond the just the specific linear relations between the elements of this system, that extra information is consciousness. And from his understanding, um, and it's, uh, I think there's a, a lot of validity as far as I understand the, the theory and the, and, the, and, and the sort of thinking behind it. Under his understanding, there's really, we can talk about panpsychism, that every um, molecule <clears throat> um, or even every atom in the universe um, has some tiny degree of consciousness. And, and I feel that if we explore that, I feel like maybe it's reasonable to think of consciousness as a spectrum. So then it's not like that, oh, holy, holy, wow, wow, everything in the universe is conscious, but more like just if we think of consciousness as being a spectrum and saying, um, where are the biggest shifts in that consciousness? That's again, where I see life itself as probably the most important uh, significant uh, phase transition in that level of consciousness. And that's where I see a consciousness itself being enacted. Um, it's mm -hmm. like it only arises as a process of um, an organism and um, relating to the outside, being aware of itself as an or organism and interacting with it in some kind of way. So anyway, that's just uh, a little bit more of an exploration of that. I don't know, do you have any thoughts on that, Matt? Yeah, I like that connection. I mean, I'm partial to panpsychism uh, myself. I like what you say about a spectrum of consciousness. It doesn't just click on all of a sudden uh, one day when matter arranges itself just so, but rather it, it there might be some jumps because of a emergent um, complexification, but uh, there's never a zero point, right? And, but in terms of, you know, the relevance of um, quantum theory, and interconnectedness. I mean, there's a lot of spookiness that gets imported into the study of quantum theory, largely because the physicists themselves are so reluctant to interpret the, the theory, which is, I've heard that quantum theory described more as a recipe for making um, accurate predictions. And mm -hmm. what it is that's actually going on in that realm, many physicists are reluctant to speculate. The theory works. And that's good enough for them. I mean, the, the motto is kind of shut up and calculate, right? Um, you know, but for philosophers like us, we want to know what's actually going on there, what's being revealed to us about the nature of reality. And I think a simple way to understand it is, is again, science is recognizing how you can't remove the um, observer from that which is being observed. Mm -hmm. And you don't even need quantum theory for this. Let's just think about any form of measurement. When you, when you stick a, um, a temperature probe, a thermometer into a chamber of gas, to some small degree, that probe itself is gonna impact how the molecules are bouncing around in there. Might not be a significant enough effect to throw off your measurement that much, but the point is to measure something, you're disturbing it, right? Quantum theory brings in a, a, a more refined um, kind of sensitivity to this question where to observe something at the quantum scale, you need to shine light on it. But at that scale, whatever you're looking at is going to be affected by the mm -hmm. photons that you're shining on it, just to look, just to get a look at it. So what it's revealing is exactly that interconnectedness and that this form of science that imagined we could step outside of nature to look in from it as if we were a disembodied god of some kind is is the wrong way to imagine what scientific knowledge is about. It's participatory. Um, and I think quantum theory is a, a very um, well-established example that uh, can't really be refuted as to why that is the case. Um, mm. 
So let's move on to a question from Laura. Laura asks, can you speak more about the role of the non-human natural world, the wild, mm -hmm. uh, which is diminishing, if not diminished already, and how uh, non-humans mm -hmm. interconnect in the web of meaning? Mm. <clears throat> yes, yeah, thank you for bringing our <clears throat> non-human relatives into this conversation, Laura. And um, it is so terribly diminished, um, <clears throat> in fact, um, you know, by most estimates, <clears throat> if we look at um, what is wilderness right now, if we look at the abundance of nature, um, of non-human nature right now in the world versus um, some millennia ago before human civilization unfolded, um, there's probably 90% probably of that abundance has been lost. So we're not just talking about species that have been lost, but just a very richness and abundance. So <clears throat> it's, it's, a, it's an absolute disaster for the living earth, <clears throat> what, <clears throat> what humans have done to it so far. And it's only increasing at a greater and greater rate. And I think that um, that has so much to do with this view of um, non-human nature as a resource, rather than looking at its inherent rights to live. And something <clears throat> I explore about in detail in the book is uh, what I call like animate intelligence, which is basically this deep intelligence that exists everywhere in nature, that exists not just in elephants and cetaceans and those sort of high functioning mammals that we feel we can relate to, um, but exists in trees. Um, and trees have 20 different senses, um, way more than we have um, as, uh, um, as mammals. Um, <clears throat> trees um, are intentional. And they, they make decisions. They actually work together as groups, you know, through the mycorrhizal fungal network, um, which biologist Suzanne Simard has called the wood wide web. Um, and they'll actually even allocate resources through that. And then just even at the single cell has been shown to have this incredible intelligence and going through <clears throat> thousands of different um, signaling um, elements all at the same time. It's just um, mind blowing complexity in a single cell of which we have 40 trillion in our bodies. So once we realize that, we realize that as humans, um, we're not these like Cartesian separated, I think therefore I am entities. Actually, we are part of animate intelligence. We are part of this unfolding and deep interconnectedness of all life. And I think that's the way that we can find the gateway to see <clears throat> that humans, we, because of the extra powers uh, that we have developed through our thinking mechanism and our technology, we have been causing the devastation of so many of our, um, like our living non-human relatives. And we need to go back to some of those great indigenous insights and like Metakuye Oyasin from the Lakota community, which basically means um, all our relations and this recognition of all life as being part of our family, which modern biology validates. Turns out um, <clears throat> that like a fruit fly shares more than half of its genes with us as humans, and even a banana shares 44% of its genes. We are all related. And once we start from that foundation, <clears throat> then I feel we can we can really begin to reevaluate our relationship with our, our non-human living relatives. Mm, yes, beautiful. I mean, one of the ways I think about the new sciences is in terms of this kind of relationality to the non-human world, where what constitutes scientific mm -hmm. knowledge mm -hmm. is, in fact, an alliance that human beings are forging with non-human agencies. So for example, you know, when Louis Pasteur, the um, French chemist, recognized um, that there were microorganisms uh, that helped to break down food and cause fermentation mm -hmm. and so on, he realized that, oh, actually human beings for all this time making wine have been collaborating with this microorganism. Mm -hmm. And so whether we're doing, uh, whether we're baking bread with the, the helpers, the yeast that are helping the bread inflate, or whether we're making wine or whether we're building a particle accelerator, mm. we're trying to forge relationships with non-human actors um, in order to bring forth a reliable relationship, which we call knowledge. In other words, when I interact with the non-human world in this way, it reliably does this. But we know that 
you know, the non-human world has values and aims of its own, and it might change in the future. So our knowledge should never be imagined to be sort of this fixed, um, you know, um, these fixed truths that are wrestled by the heroic human away from a from a dead nature, but rather we're constantly negotiating and in relationship with non-humans in order to establish uh, what counts as knowledge. Mm. <clears throat> yeah, and I what, what I would add to that is just this um, <clears throat> this real this realization that once we do see our deep connectedness with all of life in the way that we've just been describing, we also have to look very clearly at the fact that our current capitalist uh, global civilization is destroying so much life around us. And it's we can't just <clears throat> sort of enjoy that sense of I am life that wills to live in the midst of life that wills to live and leave it there. We then go to this place of going, and life is getting destroyed in so much of its richness by uh, what is going on in this system. And those of us um, <clears throat> who are in privileged places uh, in the global north in this system have to recognize that much of what we take for our um, a sort of standard quality of life is actually arising from that destruction that's taking place. And we have an imperative to do something about it, that part of this whole notion of that web of connectedness, part of that recognition that we've talked about, uh, that there is no observer separate from the observed, is this realization that when life is under attack, we as living agents have not just a responsibility, but an imperative to do something about it. In just the same way that if somebody comes along and takes a, something like a burning person and hits my and touches my hand with it, I will draw away, I'll push that person away because I don't want my being to be under attack. Similarly, life is under attack. And those, when we get to that place of identity with all of life, we're driven to do something to stop that. Mm. Yes, yes. Um... You know, just one final example about relating to non-humans that I think of, and the wilderness in particular, is that when um, European colonists arrived in North America, um, what they called North America, the the impression was that they were encountering wilderness. Mm -hmm. But in fact, the indigenous populations uh, of mm -hmm. this continent and, and South America as well were mm -hmm. managing the, the land in such a way that you know they had controlled fires and they were planting food forests and it they, there was an example of a harmonious relationship between human beings mm -hmm. and the non-human world that was it wasn't just a sort of hands-off conservation let's just leave it alone because humans can only ruin it it was more of an active engagement and a, a cultivation and enrichment by human beings of the natural world around them. And I think sometimes Europeans, Westerners have this conception of nature as something that humans can only destroy. Mm -hmm. When in fact, I mean, our scientific understanding only enhances the capacity we could yes. have if the values changed for us to really, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. enrich the natural world. That's a, a key point, um, Matt. And, and thank you for, for bringing that up. And th there's this great phrase that I talk about in the book that um, Kat Anderson, um, a scientist here in California who studied Native American land management in California calls Tending the Wild. That's actually mm -hmm. the name of her book. And it's this notion that it's not just, oftentimes we think that there's, there's this nomadic hunter gatherers and there's agriculture, and those are the only two uh, sort of dimensions. And her point is that the what the, native Californians uh, ended up discovering and all over North America and other parts of the world prior to Western imperialism was that there was ways of relating to the wild that brought out health in those natural systems as well as working for the benefit of humans. And that's the vision of what's possible for our future. Hmm. Yeah. So we've got about five minutes left. Um, let's see, we've got another question. This one is anonymous. Um, what essence is needed in conversation with ourselves, with others, and in groups uh, to help people honor and integrate all these different worldviews? What essence is needed in conversation with self, others, and groups mm. to help people honor and integrate the different worldviews? 
Yeah, <clears throat> thank you for that profound question. And um, I have an answer for it. Um, quite simply, um, kindness. Mm. Uh, kindness is, I think, what is needed above all. And actually, the very word kindness comes from this notion of, um, from this old English word of kin, and this acting to others as if they were kin. <clears throat> and I think that's what we need when we are in um, trying to push all these things together into this future we need to go to. We need to recognize <clears throat> that when people are offering resistance to ideas we have, or, <clears throat> or really starting within ourselves, when we see resistance to these new ideas within ourselves, um, we can actually approach that resistance with kindness. We can recognize there's parts of us that um, <clears throat> developed in order to try to make sense of things in a certain way. Um, and uh, it's only through kindness that they can actually be let go more easily with less conflict. And similarly, when we're looking <clears throat> at those Trump supporters or those uh, corporate agents who are <clears throat> actually right there on the front lines destroying the earth and seeming to do it so cynically, we need to recognize that in almost all cases, um, these are people who actually are suffering within themselves from this worldview of separation. People who have had their true human uh, desires for connection and warmth um, like shut out of them, like pushed out of them. And so if we approach all of these different conversations, um, all these different uh, potential conflicts with a sense of kindness that doesn't mean being nice and that doesn't mean like um looking for compromises or letting other people get the better of us but it means that as we really um, get engaged to be agents for life recognizing that those who are stopping that actually um ultimately have these this deep need for love and care underneath all of that hard stuff and trying to reach that is of, is really what offers this possibility for the transformation we need. Mm. Yeah, I love that kindness and compassion, recognizing the suffering of those who are still entrenched in the old worldview. Yeah, mm -hmm. so important. Mm. Um, so let's move ahead. I think we have time for two more questions. Uh, there's a question from Noah. Um, is the idea of a web of meaning in any way similar to the Jungian idea of the collective unconscious? Is mm -hmm. the idea of the web of meaning compatible? Uh, this is, a, I guess, a secondary question. Is it compatible with the idea of a reincarnated mind or with reincarnation? Mm. So collective unconscious and reincarnation, yeah. how does that fit in? Um, uh, I talk about Jung's <clears throat> ideas of collective unconscious in, in the book. Um, and I would say that the idea of the web of meaning most definitely incorporates the sense of collective unconscious within it. <clears throat> because um, when we look at, at Jung's ideas and we look at it and we actually apply a systems lens of recognizing consciousness as being this complex interconnection of different systems, we see that um, there are actually, um, we, I actually look at cultural archetypes uh, as being uh, what I call attractors of consciousness, um, which lead to uh, attractors of culture. And attractors are a concept that comes from systems thinking that looks at how systems um, have this overall pattern that is both resilient, but also changes over time, but stays within recognizable uh, behaviors. And <clears throat> we can actually trace some of these patterns of consciousness back all the way to the earliest times to uh, those deep cultural, those deep archetypes that Jung actually um, identified. And even prior, prior to human, because the, um, these archetypes form within our embodied consciousness, that same animate intelligence, that animate consciousness I was describing before that we share with all of life. So I see very much full consistency between that Jungian concept with the, what I describe in the web of meaning. Reincarnation is a, a different ball of wax, if you will, um, in the sense that there's obviously different ways in which reincarnation can be understood. But the classic way of reincarnation uh, being described in um, most Vedic uh, traditions, as well as um, <clears throat> sort of those come from, that come from that, has this little bit of a similar dualistic notion 
to this Western idea of a soul, like this kind of indivisible essence that somehow um, is eternal and <clears throat> that leaves the body and then goes into some sort of great unknown and then gets reincarnated in another body. But <clears throat> so I have trouble with some of that dualistic split in that regard. If we think of, we we can think of reincarnation in a different way, though, which in which my book and what I lay out there is fully consistent with, is this recognition that the actual my identity is not just fixed in my physical body, but is actually um, part of the pattern of relations, um, which I call the the li those principles of organization that the Neo-Confucianists discovered. Um, it's the patterns of relation of me with everyone and everything else around me, like ripples in this ocean of connectedness. And to some great degree, my identity and the identity of each of us exists in those ripples. So after each of our bodily incarnations die, a vast big part of our, our identity actually still lives on through these um, these ripples that may join with other ripples to actually form new archetypes or new big attractors of cultural or uh, of consciousness that may exist way after our physical bodies have been alive. So in that sense, I think we can very much feel into that reincarnation, but not so much in that um, dualistic kind of perception. Mm. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. Um, it seems to me that this form of reincarnation that you're describing can really uh, contribute to checking this somewhat dominant strain of um, religiosity in the West, where there's this sense that there's one life, and after this life, if you're good, you go to heaven, if you're bad, you go to hell, and that's it. It's sort of end scene, whereas there are some forms of reincarnation, such as the one you're describing, where um, really there is nowhere else to go, and that when we die, we become part of this larger um, stream of life that continues. Mm -hmm. And we may not remember who we were. We may not have this, this soul substance that you're, you were first describing um, that continues, but nonetheless, who we truly are now will continue in some form. Mm -hmm. um, and so it mitigates against this escapist uh, mentality that's somewhat prevalent. Um, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's do one final question here. Um, this is from Dave and Dave asks, do you subscribe to the idea of all the ecosystems on earth comprising a living earth or Gaia? It seems to me that this perception collectively manifested would lead to the sort of transformation that we are aiming for. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> yeah, thanks for, <clears throat> for that question. And again, I do describe <clears throat> the whole set of thoughts and ideas around Gaia in my book. Um, and the simple answer is yes. Um, I, I, I do think it's very valid <clears throat> to recognize um, that life on earth and the whole, and really the whole relation between the physical earth itself and life as being an, a, like a living entity. Um, <clears throat> and while some uh, <clears throat> scientific, um, uh, of perception approaches to that might claim, well, actually, Gaia is not alive if you look at definitions of life <clears throat> um, that have certain criteria. And I, I explore this, and there is some truth to that. But if you look at the underlying, um, <clears throat> truly defining quality of life, that desire for more, that is that um, that like um, intentionality to reverse entropy that we were talking about before, we can very much recognize that Gaia is alive and that we are part of Gaia. And I do feel that's an, an, an important and actually scientifically um, valid, valid way of really perceiving life on earth. It's something which also is truly sacred. And the, I don't think we need to be afraid of these words like sacredness and even the uh, divinity of life itself in the sense that um, it's something to really uh, feel a, a sense of devotion for, because that is what we are. It's not like looking for sacredness in some other dimension. It's recognizing that we are all part of this incredible, miraculous unfolding that's been happening over billions of years. And um, as you point out in your book, it's, it's threatened. This miraculous unfolding mm -hmm. is threatened uh, because of a disconnect 
in our worldview. And um, as we bring this conversation uh, to a close, I want to thank you, Jeremy, for uh, what you've shared with us tonight and also for this book and your first book. You're making a contribution to uh, what Thomas Berry uh, called the great work, which is you know trying to uh, transform our uh, modern consciousness into something more life-affirming, recognizing its place within this, this Gaian uh, life that we call planet Earth. And so um, just I have uh, deep gratitude and, uh, and respect for the work that you're doing. And I want to thank you for that. And uh, unless you have any final words, but just to uh, thank you, Matt, and thank all those questioners for coming up with such you know, profound and interesting questions uh, that was uh, really enjoyable to explore. Thank you. Definitely. And so with that, I'll hand it back over uh, to Jason to uh, bring us home. Thank you all so much for attending today. We hope that you'll join us for more of our upcoming talks and workshops. This conversation was recorded. If you'd like to watch it again or share it with your community, it will be available on our YouTube channel at the same link and on our Facebook page. We will also feature this talk on our podcast, which you can find at ciispod.com or by searching CIIS Public Programs on your favorite podcast app. Thanks again for joining us and good night. <laughs>